Hey everybody, welcome back to our materials informatics series. In our last video, we talked about convolutional neural networks and they are amazing. They're amazing because they allowed us to do feature-free engineering, right? We didn't have to worry about designing these features. It found them automatically through the use of really cool kernels uh, convolved over our image to create filters. And then those filters can be pooled and blah, blah, blah. We end up with this awesome ability to find features on its own. It was revolutionary. It was absolutely amazing and it remains amazing. Now today, in today's video, we're going to talk about another amazing advancement that came in the field of deep learning, which can be applied to material science as well. And this one has to do with what we call recurrent neural networks. Okay, So last time in the video, we said that maybe the assumption that all the data in an image, it matters where those pixels are located one with another positionally. Well, in this video, we make a similar argument, but this time it has to do with the sequence of the data that gets fed in. In fact, it makes sense that some information only makes sense or can be best made sense if you preserve the uh, sequence in which it was captured. Think of this paragraph. This is from a paper that I wrote a couple years ago. You know, if you just scrambled those words together and then tried to have a neural network trained from it, it would not make any sense. It matters that we talk about this word before that word and that followed by that a couple words later is this word, right? That order matters. Same thing with like music, right? If you have a single note, let's say you're trying to build a neural network which can train off of a single note and then predict the next note to make music or whatever else, right? You need to know the sequence of that data when you're training it. You can't just ignore the fact that data came in with a specific sequence, right? So when we're dealing with sequential data, how on earth do we deal with that? Because if you think back to our neural networks from before, there was no way to pass information forward. Right? We took our regular neural network, it had, it had an input, one of our images, for example, in the data set. We passed it through the network, it made a prediction, we did back propagation after some number of these to update our weights. But it never said like, oh, because this last image had this value, I'm going to treat this next image differently. Right? I'm going to model it differently. I'm going to change my output based off of that. Or in other words, there was no way to store memory of information from previous layers when building your subsequent layers. Right? Because it assumes that all data points are independent of one another and that there's no independent that there's no dependence on them. Well that may not be the case. Take a look here. This is from a paper again I wrote a couple years ago where we were doing Raman spectroscopy as a function of temperature. So in this image on the left you see temperature and then you see the wave well the wave number, right? and then intensity is encoded as color. So we start out at room temperature, we measured the spectroscopy of these samples, right, the Raman spectroscopy, and then we heated them up a little bit, and then we heated them up, and heated up, and we kept on measuring these things. And you can see that the sequence does matter, like these peaks are there, but they're getting weaker, and then they disappear, right, you can see that here, like there's a big peak, it gets smaller until it's gone. Same thing with this peak, it sort of changes. That iterative nature, if we want to be able to predict that for materials properties like this, where the sequence matters, well, then we need a model that takes into account whatever the previous model did at the previous sequence, right? And that's why somebody discovered recurrent neural networks, right? So recurrent neural networks is, in its most simple approach, just a bunch of regular recurrent neural networks done in a loop. The key thing here is that we're going to pass some information forward each time. So imagine this string of text, which I got from this YouTube video, where it says, what time is it? Question mark. So those are the five words that come in from the total phrase that we're now going to iteratively you know use those to train from say to predict the next word right to answer this question well it's three o'clock or whatever right well you build one neural network which if it got that word it would have one output but you don't stop there you then train it on the next in input which is this word and you receive some information from your previous network so now this neural network has not only the learning that it gets from this first or the second word, but it also has the first word. And then you pass both of those forward, and now you see that it, it's learning from all three, learning from all four, learning from all five. But the amount of shape, right, the amount of area covered by each one of these colors is not uh, accidental or just artistic. It's meant to show you the fact that really, by the time you're at this fifth layer, the amount of learning which is carried over from your first input is getting smaller. It's mostly paying attention to the layers that were most. Uh, recently seen. The ones that are further back, it's starting to forget them. What do we mean, we, we mean, what do we mean by forget? It, it's a problem called the vanishing gradient problem. 
you remember from our neural, our vanilla neural network video, right, that we talked about back propagation. And we showed you how you can actually calculate a matrix, right, uh, a tensor which represents all of the gradient in your, in your model, which is basically as you change each and every one of those weights and biases, what does that do to the overall cost function? And you can change it in a way that minimizes your cost, right, and therefore makes your model better. The problem is that as you do back propagation from one whole neural network to another one, to another one, to another one, this gradient disappears. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Hence why they call this the vanishing gradient problem. You're, you're essentially unable to make meaningful changes to this original model based off of, or to this current model based off of information from this previous model because you're just losing it, right? So this is the, this is the idea of a neural network and it's just okay. We would say that it has a really short-term memory because it can't look back to that many sequences prior when making its next prediction. And what do we mean in terms of numbers? Well, it depends on the actual architecture, but maybe something like if there's, you know, if you've got many, many numbers or inputs in a sequence, this might only be able to look back, say, 100, right, of those. And after that, it doesn't really remember what came before that. Well, maybe that matters because if you're predicting, like, the next word to type into your, you know, recipe, maybe you need to look back two or three hundred words to remember that like oh this was a rock salt structure and so because it's a rock salt we know something about its stability or whatever having a short-term memory won't let you do that so uh, I like that this this sort of shows in code format pseudocode format what's happening in a neural network a recurrent neural network so it says okay we've got this recurrent neural network um, we're going to do a feed forward uh, neural network and we're going to have hidden states so these are the things that we're going to use and then it's going to say for each word in our input phrase so which is really saying element by element in our sequential data, we're going to take the output and the hidden state, and those are going to be given to us by sending the individual word that we're looking at and the hidden state from the prior through the recurrent neural network. That will then give us the output and a new hidden state. And then we just iterate through this. We go one by one through it. And then the final prediction is the feed forward from the output. Right? So that's one way to think about these things. And they're just like, it's like a bunch of neural networks in a row. And because there's a bunch in a row, and because backpropagation basically kills our gradient as we move backwards, they're just okay. They're just okay. They're slow, but they're not amazing. So we need a solution to this. And the biggest thing that we need to fix is the fact that these things forget, that they have a short-term memory. So there are some solutions out there. There's LSTMs and GRUs. LSTM stands for long short-term memory, so it's still short-term memory, but it's longer this time. And GRU uh, stands for gated recurrent unit. Um, and basically, you know, these are better than recurrent neural networks. They're able to predict things better. They're able to remember things longer, but they're also slower. That's sort of the trade-off. So how on earth do they work? Let's sort of dive into a little bit of the details here, and there's better resources out there, and I've got some links to them here if you want, but uh, here's a couple. Let's look at the LSTM and the GRU. In both of these, they rely on what we call gates to help regulate the flow of information. In both of them, they have a, a new thing that they're adding, which is essentially a memory state, which is allowing you to remember things. And then the gates allow you to remember, they allow you to add things to that memory or take things away from that memory if they're not important so you can update the memory in real time. So how on earth do they do all this? Well, let's kind of go through it. A regular recurrent neural network, it takes it, each one of these greenish blue blocks is, uh, you could think of it as a neural network, where it receives the data from the sequential data, right? So here's the input from the first sequence, the second sequence would come in here, the third sequence come in from here from the bottom, and the fourth sequence would be here. But it doesn't just receive the input of each element sequentially, it also receives from the left-hand side whatever it got previously. From the previous state, it receives what we call the hidden state. The hidden state gets passed forward as well. These two things get combined in some way. They go through our neural network, and now you've got it. the hidden state is the output of your first network becomes the hidden state for your next network. It combines that with its input, and then it passes it forward. Something that you'll notice here is that this one has the little blue marker and this one doesn't. That little blue marker stands for a hyperbolic tangent. A hyperbolic tangent, it basically looks like this shape. It goes from negative 1 up to positive 1. So these are positive 1 up here and negative 1. So if your numbers are really big, it just flattens them out to 1. And if they're really negative, then it flattens them to negative 1. This just prevents your uh, numbers in your input vector right here from just getting out of control. So it's going to keep them mostly bounded between negative 1 and positive 1. 
whereas these ones might blow up and diverge and do awful things. But this is just a recurrent neural network. What does an LSTM do differently? Well, let's take a look at the diagram. In this diagram, wherever you see a red circle, red circle, blue circle, red circle, blue circle there, those are all neural networks. So the overall LSTM block or cell is actually made up of several neural networks, right? And they're all doing different things. You see here that you have up along the top this long flat line, that's our cell state. The cell state, that lets us hang on to and transfer useful information directly on to the next sequence in the chain. And this cell state is connected from the first data point in your series of data all the way to the end, right? So again, on that example of the Raman spectroscopy as a function of temperature, this would be connected from room temp. We went all the way up to high temp, and then all the way back to room temp. That would be connected all the way along there, okay? That's our cell state. Think of it like the memory, okay? And then you have gates, and the gates move information onto and off of that cell state, allowing us to remember things like, oh yeah, that's a really important detail to remember, or you know what, that's not that important. I can forget that, right? So you have your forget gate, which takes the, down here, this would be the hidden state from your previous cell. This is the input from our current sequence of data. It's going to combine those together, and it's going to first pass them through a sigmoid. A sigmoid, similar to a ta hyperbolic tangent, whereas hyperbolic tangent went from negative 1 to positive 1. What's a sigmoid do? Just like that. It goes from 0 to positive 1. Well, that's useful because it allows us to forget zero or remember one something right it's going to turn things on or turn things off is what that sigmoid's doing so it's bas this is basically saying based off of what we got from our last cell lstm cell the hidden state and what our current data is what stuff can we forget what stuff doesn't seem important that gets written to our forget gate it updates the cell state by turning some things off meanwhile you're going to have your input gate right so your input gate it says updates your cell state using previous hidden state data and your current state. The sigmoid tells us what to keep and the tanch output condenses it between reasonable numbers, negative one to positive one, right? Then you'll notice that we have this x and these pluses. The x's are pointwise multiplication. So you're going to multiply the input from your now condensed candidate states and then you're going to write that, pointwise addition, you're going to write that to the cell state. Over here you have your output gate. This decides what the next hidden state should be. It does the tanch, right, the hyperbolic tangent, to bring in the current memory, and the sigmoid tells us what to keep and what to forget. So in terms of pseudocode, this might look like this. You're going to make a function called LSTM cell, and it receives the previous cell state, the previous hidden state, and your current input value of your sequential data. It's going to do an operation called combine. A combination combine is your previous hidden state plus your input. It's going to combine them together. You've got FT, which is your forget, is equal to forget layer where you send it combine. Whatever your combine was, your, your previous end state and your input gets sent through this forget layer, and then the output is FT for forget. You have candidate where you're sending it through a candidate layer, this, com this com combination, and then you have your input layer where you're just combining those two things. Okay. Then you've got CT, that's your cell state. It's going to be equal to whatever your previous cell state was, right? That's passed in from the left here. It's going to multiply that by whatever you want to forget. And then it's going to add to that candidate new information multiplied by your input data, right? So it's telling it, forget this, but remember that is what's happening there. Then the output is going to, you're going to take this combine and you're going to run it through the output. And finally, your new hidden state that gets passed forward is equal to the output multiplied by the hyperbolic tangent of your cell state. And it returns, like the return from this block of code, these four or five neural networks is the hidden state and the cell state. That's what gets passed forward to the next cell, uh, LSTM cell, right? And then you would do this for as many cell states, LSTM cells as you want to do. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, gated recurrent units work in almost the same way. They're very similar to LSTMs, but this time we've removed the cell state. This time they only have a hidden state, and this is used to hold all of your memory. You have an update gate, and this acts like the forget and the input gate of an LSTM, and you have a reset gate, and this decides how much of your past information should be forgotten versus retained, right? One of the advantages of these gated recurrent units is that they do have fewer tensor operations where you're adding things together and multiplying and whatever, and so they are a little bit faster, but they tend to be a little bit worse performers like usual, right? If something works better, it's typically a little bit slower, okay? 
Um, let's look at the math of these in terms of uh, what's going on here. In a forget gate, the output of your forget gate, f sub t, is going to be, we pass it through a sigmoid, right? Just like we saw with our neural networks a couple videos ago. And what are we applying to that? Well, it's going to be the weights and the biases based on the information from our previous hidden state, h of t minus 1, the previous sequence data hidden state, plus our current data, xt, right? We, we, that's just a regular neural network, right? And then the input gate is going to be the same thing. We're going to have a sigmoid. This time, it's the weights and the biases, again, of our hidden state and our current data. That's going to be the output of that input gate. And then you've got this C with the little tilde on top. That means our candidates. Well, that's equal to the hyperbolic tangent of we have weights and biases, our previous cell state, and our current input. The update of the cell state, so this is changing what the value stored in the cell state is. It's going to be equal to the forget multiplied by the previous cell state, t minus 1, so whatever your previous LSTM cell block was, plus your input output, right, the, the whatever was returned from the input operation multiplied by the candidate operation. That's get, that gets added to your cell state. And then finally, your output is going to be a sigmoid of your weights and biases of the previous hidden state, the current data. And then you're going to take that and you're going to do that your output is, it needs to be multiplied by the hyperbolic tangent of your current cell state. So that's it. Um, I hope that this kind of makes sense. These LSTM blocks, uh, GRU blocks, are pretty cool. Um, now, before we're done, let me just point out that these different ways of dealing with sequential data with recurrent neural networks, um, there's lots of different ways to actually put the data together. You can do a one-to-one, -one, meaning from one output, you're going to predict, from one, from one input, you're going to predict the next thing, just one thing, right? There's one-to-many. This is a good example of this is with audio. Let's say I'm, I give it a sequence of melody notes. And from those one melody notes, from, say from like one instrument, I now want to go out to many things, like the whole band. I want to produce bass and drums and a singer and all these other things. So from one thing, we want to use a recurrent neural network to predict to many things. Or from many to one. Um, many to one might be like the, the example you usually see here is sentiment um, analysis, where maybe you read a bunch of Google reviews of a restaurant over time. So it's time dependent, hence it's sequential data. But there's a whole bunch of these things. And what you want is just one takeaway, like is it a good restaurant or a bad restaurant? Do people like it or dislike it? So that would be many going to one. And then there's many to many, like this could be language translation. I, I bring in a sentence in English and I want to convert it to a language uh, like Spanish or something. Well, that might involve different numbers of words. Like to say I love you is three words in English, but in Spanish that's just te quiero, right? It's just two words. So these need to be flexible in those cases. I want to show you one thing here before we're done with today's video. And that's what sequential data looks like for audio. This is so cool. So this is from OpenAI. If you're not familiar with OpenAI, OpenAI and DeepMind and Google are some of the big names doing um, really cool stuff in machine learning. They were able to train data off of different artists. So maybe Katy Perry or Frank Sinatra or John Denver or whatever. And then they can actually export um, AI music where this is generatively designed music that's in the same style as certain artists. Like, let's listen to this one from John Denver. If you listen to this one, it's in the style, now the genre of American folk, because it's trained off of his work. And take a look at this. Let's jump ahead and you can see it. How crazy is that? So you can see that, you know, it can produce things in different styles. And because it's doing a one-to-many output, you can see that it actually produces lyrics. That's just one of the many things it can output. Uh, just like it can produce drums and whatever else to go along with these things and anyways pretty wild stuff so i hope this was useful um for our next video we're going to talk about the problems with uh recurrent uh neural networks because they're not perfect they if if a regular um recurrent neural network can remember back maybe a hundred data points in a series of data when you do an LSTM, it can maybe look back maybe a thousand data points, but it's still not very good. It still has this problem of forgetting, right? And when you forget inputs, we talked about that, that there's this catastrophic forgetting in machine learning, which is problematic. So we needed a better solution. We needed to be able to look at all of our data and remember all of it. And that's what led to the discovery of transformers. More about those in our next video.